This week, Huddersfield chairman Dean Hoyle and Aaron Moy on the Terrier's terrific start. Ex-Arsenal vice chairman David Dean on the part he played in shaping the Premier League. And Darren Fletcher explains why his crippling illness may have prolonged his career. Huddersfield Town's first ever Premier League goal. With a chance and a goal. And it's an opening day victory for Huddersfield Town. A day they'll never forget. Hijinks in Huddersfield. Consecutive wins to start the season. Nearly 40 years ago, a young Yorkshireman took his first step on an incredible journey. It was that time in a child's life when you're forced to decide on a path, forced to choose your allegiance. I had two friends, one Leeds, one Huddersfield. Um, could have gone to either. Um, Graham Johnson got me on the bus to go left uh, to Huddersfield, um, past the ICI Chemical Works. Um, 11, 12 years old, um, on the terrace, um, lots of grown men um, smoking, drinking. Football came out, the euphoria of the, the win, the goals. Not being a glory hunter, I kind of like uh, having a good morning on those terraces. Um, I don't know what it feels like to be on the, on the end of them, but uh, no, first taste of football, um, I would say, really traditional, honest, hard-working club, and um, yeah, it's close to my heart. Then in 79, it was a promotion season. We had a fantastic manager in Mick Buxton, a hero of mine. Um, we had some fantastic players, um, Ian Robbins, um, uh, Mally Brown, Stanton. But, oh, unbelievable. And um, you know, that team is still the heroes of me today. And I always said to me, when we got promoted at Wembley, I rung Mick Buxton up and I said, Mick, thank you very much. And he said, in his jaw, the accent, Why, what am I done, Dean? I said, it wasn't for you, Mick, uh, getting me hooked on this football club in 79. I would never appreciate it or never witness the best day I've had in my life. I said, thank you. So um, I think that touched him a bit, and he's quite a hard character, isn't it? The entrepreneur began his retail empire by selling greetings cards from the back of a van before opening his first shop in 1997. The card factory would have around 500 stores by the time Hoyle sold the company in 2010, a year after becoming chairman of his boyhood club. I think what I've tried to do in the, in, in the early days is take the club from um, a, a League One, mid-table obscurity, going nowhere, riddlership, into the championship. And I knew I had the finances person to do that. Um, but let's be fair, you know, the Premier, the Premier League where we are now is um, um, it's a different ball game. You know, I listened to Mike Ash saying you know, when he bought Newcastle, it was like a bicycle. And 10 years later, it's like a Formula One in the outside lane. And uh, it's probably as extreme as that. And since I took over Huddersfield Town, you know, what I believed I could do with it 10 years ago is not realistic now. And, um, and like David Wagner said, you know, what we've done is not realistic, um, but anything's possible. And um, all our dreams have come true and uh, exciting. For Huddersfield Town to be in the Premier League, um, we deserve to be there. Um, uh, we're not here to say hello, we're here to, to stay. Um, but we also are very mindful of the challenge which that brings. After three years of simply surviving in the championship, Hoyle felt the Terriers needed a change of approach, so gambled on Jurgen Klopp's best man and former assistant at Borussia Dortmund. Like Klopp at Liverpool, David Wagner has brought his footballing philosophy to the city and embraced its culture. When David first came into Huddersfield, he was very uh, realistic, did his homework, he knew um, what a tight-knit place this is. Um, and he made the team replicate that from honesty, hard working, togetherness, terrier spirit, hard working, um, no limits. And uh, it's come together well. And um, I think what David's done um, by replicating Huddersfield, Huddersfield as an area has, uh, has worked really well. And uh, we got over the line. And like we say, we had no right to do what we did, but anything's possible. One bloke from. We are Premier League! We are Premier League! He's not quite as German as I first thought. He's actually got quite a sense of humour, which uh, I think the Germans had. But um, um, very straight talking. Um, if David says to me, Dean, can we have a meeting at half past one? It doesn't mean 25 past 12 or 25 to 2. It means half past one. Um, he's very, very... Um, it's like a BMW. 
He's very, very efficient. He knows what he wants. Um, he's not prepared. He is prepared to to change his mind if he's, if he's if he thinks something's different. But he's very structured. He's a very structured individual. Um, probably everything you expect a German coach to be. Uh, believes in his ways, um, the way he trains, the way he he um, um, communicates with the players. He's got a fantastic way of getting a very complicated system over to a footballer in a very simplistic way. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, German efficiency with a smile. It was all smiles in Huddersfield when promotion meant the chairman had to fulfil a promise made seven years earlier. It cost me fortune. <laughs> no, no, what I said to them, um, uh, we we're in League One, uh, when I when absolutely a million miles away from the Premier League, I said, look, for those guys who are loyal through my chairmanship um, and they renew their season card year after year, uh, if we ever do reach the promised land, then um, I'll make sure your first season card is, is £100. Never in a million years do I think we'd get there. So, yeah, I spent the last three weeks writing checks. So, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's the best checks I've ever written in my life. And, um, yeah, sit to our promise and uh, to bring affordable football to the masses. Dean Hoyle hasn't just spent the summer writing checks for fans. He's also broken Huddersfield's transfer record three times, including the £10 million purchase of Aaron Moy from Manchester City. The 26-year-old has already played his part in making Huddersfield the surprise package this season. 3-0! Undefeated in their opening three games, the team are third, the fans in dreamland. Huddersfield Town's first home goal in a top division match for 45 years. It's massive. You could tell that when, when we got promoted, the whole town was buzzing and there was blue and white flags and stuff everywhere, so... I know it means so much to the fans and people of Huddersfield and um, yeah, everyone's just really excited and uh, enjoying it, I think. With a goal and an assist already to his name from the opening three matches, the quietly spoken, unassuming Australian is already proving himself a monster on the pitch, underlining his importance with a match-winning performance against Newcastle. Yeah, I felt good. Uh, I felt like I had... Uh, my fitness levels were decent. Uh, I only had a shorter pre-season, so I was a bit worried if I, uh, my fitness wasn't there, but I felt good. It was a great result. We played really well, and uh, it's something we can build on. That he is proving so adept in the top flight will come as no surprise to those who have followed his progress. Before playing in England, he was at A-League side Melbourne City, where he was top scorer, player of the year, and one of the hottest prospects in Australia. As soon as uh, the City group took over, the club just uh, escalated. So everything from like the facilities, the professionalism, all around the club, it was just a massive upgrade, and that's great for Australian football to have uh, such a big organisation investing, so it's, yeah, it's really good. It's definitely lots of talent uh, in Australia. It's just sometimes you need an opportunity. At the age of 25, the midfielder was given his opportunity when he signed for Manchester City. Immediately loaned out to Huddersfield, Moy played a key role in their promotion-winning success. It was really tough at first, um, just the amount of games that you play wasn't used to it in Australia, it's a lot less games, but I really enjoyed it and it's something that I always wanted to do was to play 50 games in a season because all the top players in the world, they do that and uh, last year I was lucky enough to do that. Guiding the team's fortunes, of course, is irrepressible head coach David Wagner. The German has been a unifying force at the John Smith Stadium, instilling a spirit and identity within the group that's already carried them to such unexpected heights. He's a very passionate man, so he gets everyone very motivated and he's a great coach tactically as well. Um, yeah, I'm learning so much all the time from David and the coaching staff. He does this thing before we walk out of the game. He like slaps us on the neck really hard. <laughs> it wakes us up a bit, but yeah, he's very passionate and it's uh, yes, what you want. Aaron Moy and his fellow Terriers have certainly hit the ground running in the Premier League. If they continue to make life tough for the big boys, expectations will inevitably go through the roof, which could prove troublesome. 
So, just what can they achieve over the course of the next nine months? I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's a big question everyone wants to know, but the manager has a, a saying that we, um, we have no limits, so we don't put limitations on ourselves. We just keep going and keep trying our best and see where that takes us. One of the few players to cross the time we're divide. We're in Canada to catch up with Stephen Caldwell, now enjoying life in front of the camera. That's still to come. I think we have to turn the clock back, really, to the 1980s, when football in England was in a bad state. People don't realise what was going on. You know, we had hooliganism, there was fighting inside the grounds, fighting outside the grounds. Attendances were dropping like a stone. Women were not going to the games. Mothers didn't want the children to go to the games. They were worried about their safety. People don't remember this. Television pulled the plug on football for six months. There was no football on TV for six months in the 1980s. Of course, tragically, in the 80s, there were disasters. Bradford, and of course, in 89, there was Hillsborough, where 96 people, tragically, lost their lives. So something had to change. Football was in big trouble, so we needed to, to get some momentum into it, some new life. And the only way we could do that, really, was to reform it. All we knew is that it needed rebranding, that it needed a fresh start. Rebrand it, new legal entity called the Premier League. I was there at the table at its uh, inception. But uh, I feel it's my baby and I just want to see it healthy and successful. I often say that uh, we knew we had an aircraft on the runway ready to take off. We didn't quite know how high it was going to fly. Letitia! On he goes! Oh! And it's Collymore! I will love it if we beat them. Dennis Bergkamp is in! Rooney! I see that was special look. competitive football, entertaining football. You want to have football that the fans and you want to have the personalities that the fans want to go and see. And once you've got that, then you get the broadcasters coming in, then you get the sponsors coming in. You've always got to keep, keep your product high to make sure you're better than, than the rest. And I think that's what the Premier League has done. The fact that you've got every stadium in the Premier League today is magnificent. It's a long cry from where we were 25 years ago. The fact that Leicester a couple of years ago won the Premier League and played in the Champions League, wonderful. That's a Cinderella story. The fact is that 25% of the Premier League audience, live audience, are female. Never used to be. And the families are coming. That's healthy for the sport, because the youngsters are the fans of tomorrow. So where do I see it going from here? I'm very optimistic. I think it, the success is going to continue. I can see, thanks to television, there's still a great appetite from all the broadcasters around the world to cover the game. And that gives us courage and excitement and anticipation. It's a, it's a wonderful success story, and I, I'm just delighted, I'm proud to be part of it. The start of a new Premier League campaign brings a host of new faces and familiar ones taking on a new challenge. When Stoke manager Mark Hughes needed an experienced influence in midfield, who better than a man with more than 300 Premier League appearances to his name? Darren Fletcher. Having left West Bromwich Albion in June, it didn't take the Scotsman long to decide on his next destination. I haven't spoke to the manager and seen the way his teams play. And, you know, when you, when you move to a team, the most important factor is the manager, really. You know, it's obviously 
the club want you and you know you're, you're playing for great clubs but you know the manager is the one that picks the team you know the style of play the team's playing and, and you've got to believe in the, those uh, ethoses and, and buy into that and, and want to enjoy playing in that sort of way so yeah it was a big part of me coming here. Everything's done right from what I've seen um, a great training ground you know and um, everyone's um, doing everything they can to make um, the team perform on the pitch you know it's uh, everything's done properly and I'm enjoying the experience so far. Fletcher! Fantastic finish! Brilliantly executed by Darren Fletcher. It was sort of a mutual thing really, it just, you know, my contract was up and um, I, had a, I had an option that I could uh, extend it or, you know, look to leave and I fancied a new challenge. Um, I enjoyed my time there, I've got great respect for everyone there and the manager and the faith they put in me when I, when I was going to the club. And played every single Premier League game while I was there, you know, so it could have been easy for me to stay at West Brom. You know, I was club captain, I'd been there for two and a half years, but the new challenge of coming to Stoke, you got to start all over again, you got to improve yourself all over again, and um, I was excited by the challenge. What a great sight to see Darren Fletcher in a Manchester United kit again. And a big smile on the face of Darren Fletcher, and indeed of all Manchester United fans, to see this man back. Starting over again is an experience the former Manchester United midfielder knows only too well. In 2008, Fletcher began to suffer from the effects of a chronic bowel disease. Refusing to give in, he continued playing until 2011, when the condition became so painful he was barely able to leave the house. While surgery was successful, Fletcher needed extended breaks from the game. Now 33, the Scot remains philosophical about the lost years. I like to think that I'll add on the time I missed onto my career. I definitely see that because in terms of joints and muscles and ligaments and all those sort of things, my body had a two-year rest, although other parts of my body was fighting an illness. And you know, But things that usually halt footballers' careers, joints and limbs and things like that, they, they had a bit of a rest. So I like to put a positive spin on it and think I can add them on to, to the end of my career. I experienced it myself with many players at Manchester United, players playing well into their 30s and looking after themselves and how they did it. Um, the biggest thing is the appetite for the game, really. You know, if you've still got that hunger and appetite to train, to keep yourself fit, to look forward to the challenge of playing every weekend, and while all those things are there and the body's willing, then it's uh, anything's possible, really. Following an opening day defeat away to Everton, Stoke secured their first win of the season against Arsenal a week later. Hesse! A goal for the debutant. Despite that victory, there are those who still believe this season will prove to be the club's most challenging yet. Everyone's got an opinion and um, that's, that's their right, you know. I don't see too many people getting predictions right, so that, that makes me sleep a little bit easier. Um, you know, um, nah, we're fine and um, great bunch of lads, um, fantastic club, still looking to bring in some players, done so very recently. A very good performance away to ever, but if you're going to lose to show that sort of performance we did and that sort of attitude and to be done by a really fantastic goal and to probably have the better chance in the game and to be in complete control before that, that's definite positives. When you lose a game, you look to those positives and we can reach that level. We'll get plenty of points in this league. It's a hotbed of football where people are united in their passion but divided by allegiance. A region that craves success but is more used to failure. The last major trophy won by either club was almost half a century ago. A tough pill to swallow for a football obsessed population. Everywhere you go, you know, you go to the, the supermarket, you go to the, a bar or a pub, uh, the butchers, everywhere you go, people know you play for. Sunderland or Newcastle and they want to talk about the game. People feel because you play for their club, they have a right to, to be part of that, to, to kind of give their opinion, which, which they obviously do, they pay their money to go and watch the games, but it's intense. People go to work on a Monday and look forward to that Saturday game and um, obviously Sunderland have had their difficulties this year and uh, I know what that must feel like for some of the players and it's difficult, you lose your confidence quite quickly and uh, 
you really need to be mentally strong to, to play for one of their clubs. Oh, and he's made a mess of that as well. And what an unlikely goal scorer, it's Coldwell. The first league goal he's ever scored for Newcastle United. Mental toughness, leadership and organisation were attributes Mick McCarthy demonstrated throughout his playing career. So when he wanted a centre-half of that ilk, he turned to Caldwell. In the summer of 2004, the Scotsman became only the fifth player at the time to directly cross the tyne weir divide. It was a difficult move, obviously. Not many players have moved from Newcastle to Sunderland or, or vice versa. So I had to think long and hard, but, but Mick was was a strong believer in me, it was the reason why I went there, he was uh, a centre half and I felt like I kind of, he trusted me and I had, I had that connection with him right away so, and I also loved living in the North East and Sunderland's a fantastic club, uh, so it was never really a, a, an issue for me, I always felt like it was, a, it was a good move. Within a year, Caldwell and Sunderland were back in the Premier League, having stormed to the Championship title in 2005. However, the step up to England's top tier proved beyond the Black Cats' capabilities. It was really difficult. Uh, we, we, were, we were a good team. We got up through team spirit, teamwork, hard work. Um, we were somewhat talented. We, we had Julio Arco, who was probably our most talented player, but we were just a, a solid team. We went to Premier League and we, we, I felt Mick signed a lot of players, I don't think we improved the quality that much and it kind of ruined that team spirit that we had um, and we started slowly and it was difficult to pick up wins and it was pretty obvious we were going to be relegated by sort of the turn of the year so it was a difficult time. Sunderland's plight saw McCarthy sacked and eventually replaced by Roy Keane. Caldwell struggled for game time under the new boss so he sought first team football elsewhere and found it at Burnley. The Scotsman was soon named captain and in 2009 led them to England's top flight for the first time in 33 years. It was phenomenal, it was one of the best seasons in my career. It was, um, we played 61, 62 games. We, were in, we got to semi-finals of the, the League Cup. Uh, we got to the last 16 of the FA Cup and we obviously uh, won the player final at, at Wembley. So we were, uh, well, it was a great season. We, we had the same guys played the majority of the games. so. Uh, it was really special to go through that with that group of players, one of the, the kind of toughest groups I've ever been lucky enough to captain and, and be a part of. Amazing leaders, amazing characters. Uh, no, nobody accepted anything less than 100%, and we called each other out and we were very accountable. Patterson coming in, the, it drops a break! Top class! Victory over Manchester United was the standout moment in a very difficult campaign, which saw manager Owen Coyle leave for Bolton mid-season and the Clarets relegated at the end of it. After 104 league appearances for Burnley and five goals to his name, the curtain finally came down on Caldwell's time at Turf Moor. He moved to Wigan and then on to championship side Birmingham before receiving a call from an old friend in Canada. I always wanted to play uh, abroad in my career. I don't know if MLS was specifically one of the places, but it was something that I hope I may have the opportunity um, to do. I maybe was going to go to Red Bulls when I was at Birmingham, um, and it never really transpired. And then when I was leaving Birmingham, I was definitely going to leave, and I was looking at some other options. And just out of the blue, I got a call from Ryan Nelson and he wanted me to come to Toronto and I'd played about 45 games that season for, for Birmingham. So I was a little tired, I wanted to rest and Ryan, I tried to say to Ryan, oh, I'll come in July and he was like, no, I need you now. It was a club that had ambition, that was, knew what it wanted and didn't know how to get there. And we were lacking a little bit of quality and lacking leadership. And the minute I got here, I realised that I was the perfect guy for that. Toronto FC have took it to another level by Bradley and Jovinko and Altidore and some of the players that they have now obviously missing out in the MLS Cup but being a perennial contender in my opinion now and like I say I'm proud to have been there at the start of that. 
So after making almost 400 league appearances at nine different clubs, the boy from Stirling in Scotland has found an unlikely new home. Stephen Caldwell retired in 2015, but is still very much in touch with the game he loves. Something had happened in my school that said alcohol is the thing that is going to be your medication now. And, and I, thought that was, I thought that was going to be a good thing, but it turned out to be a, a total nightmare for me. Next week in a Premier League World special, legendary defender Paul McGrath on the demons that so nearly destroyed his life. From Marcus Buckland and me, Dave Beckett, goodbye.